A couple of weeks ago, Pflugerville uh, Hill Country Bible Church kicked off their campaign. You might remember that we started ours at uh, the beginning of the year, 30 Days of Blessing. And so I wanted to give you a chance to see that video, those of you who hadn't had a chance yet. 21 pastors representing 21 different churches that have joined together uh, and adopted this strategy to reach the unreached people of our community. I want to encourage you to continue to put this into practice. We said from the beginning when we started with that that this would be the strategy that we would be using forward, the BLESS strategy and an acronym again for BE in prayer. The B is for BE in prayer. Asking God to kind of show you, those people who are around you, that He's placed in your life, that He intends for you to have an impact with, to share your faith. The uh, L stands for listen. We're often uh, better at communicating uh, this way than we are with listening. And so we want to remember that we need to listen. We need to find out what the need is and uh, hear those who are around us that God's placed in our life. The E stands for eat or fellowship as we know it. Most of us here um, in America, we really enjoy uh, getting to know one another around food and coffee and drinks and those kinds of things. So uh, be sure to include that so that you get to know people better. The S is for serve. How can we serve those that God's placed in our life? The first S. The second S is share. Uh, we've been uh, through a series now on that, on hashtag my grace place story, being able to share the, the daily works of God in our hearts and lives. So now we advance here to hope is here and a two-part message that we're starting the first part this week on life change. One of the universal drives of humanity is a desire to improve. We spend literally billions of dollars a year on trying to improve ourselves. Uh, is there anything out there, though, that can really change me deep inside and, and make me a new person, make me the kind of person that I've always wanted to be or the kind of person that I believe God wants me to be? The next two weeks, we're going to take an in-depth look at what, what it takes really to change. Now, some people have, have given up on change. They have gone through uh, various kinds of, of uses of their personal willpower to try to change their life, uh, tr change eating habits, change the way that they, they communicate with one another. If you, uh, so some people struggle with, with anger management. They've tried to change that. They've worked hard you know, uh, to, to uh, get that corrected in their lives. And, and they, they have almost given up hope because in the end, they always go back to what they were doing before. They may have lost hope. They, they feel like that there's, there's no way that they can really make that kind of a change. Those short-term changes are easy, but the long-term change seems to be out of reach. Now, the classic text for the, in the Bible for Lasting long-term permanent change is found in the book of Romans chapter 12. You can grab a Bible nearby you there in the front seat if you want. Make it yours if you don't have a Bible of your own. And follow along with us as we look at Romans chapter 12. For the next two weeks, we're going to look at uh, the 12th chapter of Romans and look at the principles for lasting change. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The very first principle that we're going to talk about this morning is the principle of dedication, or committing my body to God. Your body has a, a profound effect on behavior. Last night we had a good crowd on a Saturday night, and Tanya is here for a double dose, and I was picking on her a little bit last night about this, but one of the things that she's learned in, in working with behavior is that posture and the body is very important to setting the mood and, and for learning. And I'm sure she has exercises she does with some of her students that help them because she's learned from the beginning that your physiology affects your psychology. Your physiology affects your psychology. Now just to prove that, we're going to do a little crowd exercise. So what I'd like you to do is set up straight, everyone if you will. All right. Very good. Now let's rotate our shoulders a couple of times. Very good. Now let's inhale deeply. Hold it. Exhale slowly. 
I don't know if you believe anything different happened, but you sure look better. You really do. I mean, <laughs> and I at least have your attention. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, any elementary student in uh, Bible school is going to learn, as they're learning uh, hermeneutics, the science of the study of the Bible, that an important thing in Scripture is whenever you come across a therefore in Scripture, you need to ask why, what it is, what is it there for? When you see a therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? Now, in, in this particular situation, Paul has already taught 11 chapters in Romans on the great things that God has done for all of mankind. He says, hey, you know, I want you to know that God did this, and God did this, and God did this. And by the way, God did this, and he did this, and he did this. And I uh, need to also illuminate you on the fact that, that Jesus did this for us, and this for us, and this for us, and, that, and then God has prepared the way for you, and then this has happened, and God did that, and, and this, and this. And then he gets to chapter 12, and he says, now in light of all of that, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Have you ever had anyone say to you, you know, I cannot be there tonight with you at that meeting. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to be there in spirit. Anyone ever have someone say that to you? I can't be there, but I'm going to be there in spirit. Do you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. It means you're going to the meeting alone, right? Because you can't be where your body's not. You can only be where your body is. The Bible teaches us that the body is a good thing, though, and not a bad thing. There's a cult at the time that uh, Jesus was on the earth, a cult that was known as the Gnostics. Spelled G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. -S. Now the Gnostics believed that the body was bad. and In fact, they went as far as to deny that Jesus had a physical body. There's no way that Jesus could have had a body, that, you know, an unholy, uh, awful body. It's very bad. And they were teaching that. But we learn from Scripture and from the, the life of Jesus that He did have a physical body and that God loves your body. He loves the body that He created for us. God created my body. God loves my body. His Spirit resides in my body. And one day, He's going to go to the trouble of resurrecting my body. And so we need to understand that God cares about our body. He values our body. Now, all of us have, have grown up with various you know, dislikes about our body, we could all go to the mirror and pick them right out. We think everyone else can probably see them as good as we can. There are things that we don't like. But the Bible teaches us that God gave us our bodies and He wants us to care for them. So the first law of change is that change is always my choice. Change is always my choice. Nobody can force me to change. You cannot uh, be influenced to change by someone else until you make a decision that you're going to change the way you think about your body, the body that God's given you, until you make a decision that you're going to do something about the body that God's given to you. No one can have any effect on that. You're going to have to make a decision. And the Bible encourages that this is the decision. Therefore, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. Now, here's a problem with that language there that says living sacrifice. Now, I don't know if you have ever thought about, you know, what those sacrifices must have been like back in the Old Testament when they brought, you know, sheep and goats and rams and birds and things like that. But it would have been awful difficult, I think, for them to offer up sacrifices that were living because the problem with the living sacrifice is it can crawl off the altar. <laughs> That's what you need to understand about the choice that God has given you. You can lay it down freely, but you can also get up and get off the altar. You can offer God one day your body as a living sacrifice, and the next day you can be moving in a completely different direction. But Paul said that it is our spiritual act of worship when we offer our bodies to God, and there are two things that you can do with your body that are spiritual acts of worship. And the first one is you can cleanse your body. Cleanse your body. Eating healthy, drinking healthy, exercising. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 
Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Two things that I want you to understand about this particular passage. First of all, what contaminates the body comes in the mouth. It goes through the mouth. What contaminates the body comes through the mouth. What contaminates the spirit comes through the eyes. I was sharing with them last night, I uh, periodically have to go back for review, for ordination, and, and uh, this was my turn, my time, and uh, they give you about five hours for this test, and I was able to get through it in about two hours, but uh, there was, there's a, towards the end of it, you get through the doctrine and the theology and, you know, all of the, the, the bylaws and constitution issues and all this kind of stuff, then you get down to a section of about 20 questions that are deep and probing about your personal life. And I didn't like that part very well. <laughs> One through four, grade yourself. How are you doing on the things that you're taking in here? How are you doing on the things that you're taking in here? How are you doing? What contaminates the body goes in through the mouth. What contaminates the spirit goes in through the eyes. The second thing that you can do as worship to the Lord using your body is to care for your body. I learned a long time ago that what I think I own, I actually is really on loan from God. Every time I think I own something, I recognize it's really on loan. We had a cleaning out of our garage, and you know there were things that I used to really treasure, and now I realize I've never owned them, and I need to get rid of them. Your body belongs to God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29 says, No one hates his body, his own body, but lovingly cares for it. Jesus as Christ, uh, cares for it just as, as Christ cares for his body. So how do, we, how do we care for our body? Exercising is a great way. Discipline or, or control. We need to rest our body. There's a lot of people running around doing a lot of things that uh, they think are helpful to keeping their body in shape that they need to take some time out to have a Sabbath. They need to take a day out of their week to rest their body, to allow their body to recover, take a nap, <laughs> whatever it is. We've been taught that that's a bad thing in society. You know, if we don't have six or seven jobs and if we're not multitasking every moment, then we are lazy and, and worthless in society. But God has called us to rest, that you do your best after you get your rest, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 4 says that each of you should learn to control your own body. This is kind of like an athlete would, in a, in a way that is holy and is honorable. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 23 says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself could be disqualified. Now, last week I was driving home, saw a magazine, or how it got in the, my truck, and thought, that's interesting, a Time magazine, threw it on the, the front seat, and when I got home, I was perusing through it and reading it, and... Um, Time, uh, 2014 Time Magazine article, I read this and I want to share it with you. 75% of the $2.5 trillion spent on U.S. health care stems from chronic disease, which can be prevented by lifestyle choices. 75% of the $2.5 trillion spent on U.S. health or health care, it stems from chronic diseases that can be prevented by lifestyle choices choices. The second principle that we see in scripture in Romans chapter 12 is the principle, what I call the principle of concentration. I must refocus my mind. I have to start thinking differently if I'm going to get different results. You know, we, we use that, that saying a lot that, uh, you know, insanity is doing the same things and expecting this time it's going to be different, right? So every year I'm going to make this resolution, every year I'm going to do these things, and then the same, you know, I'm going to get the same results that I got last year. So we have to, to em, uh, empower God to help our thinking, the principle of concentration, so that we think differently, so that we are no longer being conformed, as it says here, don't be conformed, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, to the patterns, that, that word conformed and the word pattern, if, you're, if you have your Bibles open, underline those two words, 
We're going to unpack this verse in a minute. They are important to it. Uh, Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature, whatever gets your attention gets you, doesn't it? Whatever it is that gets your attention is going to get you. So unpacking this verse, let's start with do not conform. He's saying, don't let everyone else shape your life. You have to keep your focus on what God wants you to do, what God's plan is for your life, what His design is. Don't be conformed. Don't copy everyone else. Don't shape yourself after someone else's life. Don't look after someone else and say, you know, that's, that's exactly what I need to be doing. Secondly, he says, any longer, that term any longer speaks to habit. Because what starts off, when we start off following someone or copying someone, it's going to become a habit in our life. My dad used to say that to us when we were young. My brother and I would say, you know, you're going to become like who you hang out with. And I didn't understand it when we were real young, but later as I was growing up, you know, I started realizing that uh, the friends I was hanging out with, we were talking the same. You know, we were kind of wearing the same clothes. We rode the same bikes. You know, it was just... This is, this is the thing, you know, we, we begin to pattern or, or, or become like those that we're hanging out with. That word pattern, pattern this, uh, patterns of this world, it says. Everything that you and I have learned, we have learned from some kind of a model. Some kind of a pattern that's been set in front of us. For many of us, we learned how to, to conflict resolution. We learned it from someone who patterned for us uh, conflict resolution. And... Since we live in a broken world, they may have been a really broken example of conflict resolution. Here's how we resolve conflict. I scream louder than you. And I win. Right? So we have some bad models, we have some bad examples, some bad patterns that have been set up for us. You may have, you may have learned patterns of anger management that are destructive because the, the person patterning how to deal with with Man, uh, managing your anger was, was no good at it. They were broken. And as a result of that, we've carried that on in our life. You may have learned some patterns about how to talk about issues that are happening around you to everyone else, and that's gossip. And, and so you learned that, though, and you came into it quite honestly. You were, you were taught that pattern, and so now you're just following along with that pattern, and it's very broken, isn't it? Poor work ethics can be learned, complaining, and so on and so forth. Again, all of these things can be taught by us modeling ourselves after, or patterning ourselves after a bad example. You're going to have to learn some new patterns in order to, to be able to change your life. So the second law of change is to change my life, I must change my model. Say that to a neighbor. To change my life, I must change my model. I can no longer use what I've been using in the past to model my life after. I'm going to have to change my model. There's, there's only one perfect model for you and I, and that's Jesus. Twenty times in the New Testament, Jesus said, follow me. And Paul thought, I'll add to that. So he said, follow me as I follow him. <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed in the, in the Greek is one we visited before. It's metamorpho. Say that fast five times. Metamorpho. Sounds like we are doing a Disney. Supercalifragilistic metamorphosis. <laughs> it's where we do get that word metamorphosis. Now, metamorphosis is what happens when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Now, when a caterpillar comes out of the cocoon, it is not a better version of a caterpillar, is it? It is a completely different creation when it comes out of there. In fact, so stunningly different that when the caterpillar is crawling along on the ground and he looks up and he sees a butterfly, he says to himself, you'll never get me in one of those things. Has no clue, does he? has no clue what's in store for him, how that there's going to be a radical transformation. That what started out crawling on the ground is going to be soaring and flying and beautiful in color. Listen, if you're, if you're filling your library this morning with self-help books 
and you're under the delusion that somehow you're going to be able to change yourself, just stop it. It's not going to happen. You might do good on the short term. You might have a little success, lose some weight. You know, um, you, you, might, you might do some things that you think are positive in that way. You might not have a fight for a whole 10 weeks, but then something's going to happen. <laughs> a straw that breaks the camel's back. That caterpillar looked up. He saw the butterfly. He said, hey, you're never going to get me in one of those things. He had no idea what was in store for him, just like you and I have no idea what God has in store for us as he makes us his new creation. See, this is not all, this is, what we're talking about this morning is not about turning over a new leaf. It's about a whole new life. It's not about, you know, doing, uh, changing a habit to something else. This is about a whole new life, a whole new way of seeing the world. A whole new way of seeing mankind. I had a little staff meeting last night, we were talking about when you have expectations and, you, and, then, and then down here you have actual performance. Expectations are here. Performance is here. Somewhere here in the middle, we're going to put something there. We're either going to put trust or we're going to put suspicion. Trust or suspicion from the expectations to the, to the performance. And we were telling them that we want to set an environment of trust. That my commitment to them is that I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to say, you said you'd be here at 10, you're here at 10.30, you know, therefore, you know, you're fired. It didn't work. You know, you just didn't show up. I, not even asking them what happened or what took place. I'm going, to, I'm going to trust you that if you were late, there's good reason that you were late. Because it's a different way of living as a Christian than it is living in our world, isn't it? It's a different way of looking at things. Believing and hoping and trusting and knowing the power of God to change someone and transform their life. It gives us a whole new insight on how to look at our world by the renewing of our mind. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24 says, To put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is a picture of what we did with the water baptism. Now, there was nothing magic in the tank. The, the water wasn't magic, nothing like that. We were just demonstrating physically what had happened in these lives spiritually. That they had been, the old man dies, he gets buried under the water. The new man, the new creation comes up out of the water. God's working on them. And this passage that we're dealing with right here is about sanctification, too. It's a big word. Say that to your neighbor. Sanctification. It just means God's continuing work of grace in my life. You can say this to your neighbor now. I'm not finished. God's still working on me. <laughs> But he says here that we need to learn to put off our old self and put on the new self. It, it would be like if you were going into Macy's, you had a jacket on, it was cold outside, and you had your jacket on, you go into Macy's and you go, boy, I really like this jacket here, I'm going to try this jacket on. So you grab that jacket and you go into the dressing room, but you don't take off your old jacket. You just start putting on the new, this is tight, it doesn't fit, there's something wrong with this jacket. These people need to fix. No, you got to take off the old jacket before you can put on the new jacket, right? In the renewal of your mind, to put off before you put on. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you have to take it off before you can put it on. Third principle, and we're closing with this one this morning, the principle of evaluation. Principle of evaluation. Let's say that I were to call you up, and I said, hey, never been to your house before. We've been talking about getting together and visiting. And I really would like to come to your house and, and visit you. Do you have some time today? Oh, yeah, I'm free. Everything would be great. Why don't you come on over and have lunch with us? And I was, oh, exciting. I'd love to have lunch. And uh, I said, yeah, uh, so uh, I need to know how to get to your house. And you would say to me, what would be your first question? Where are you? <laughs> Very good question. Where are you? And I would say, I have no idea. And you would say, really? I mean, do you know what state you're in? <laughs> do you know what country you're in? <laughs> do you know what? I have no idea. Man, I'm just, I don't know. 
What do you see around you? There's really not much. There's a tree, the white picket fence. That's about all I see. Can't help you. Principle of evaluation, we need to know where we are. We need to be honest. And that I was telling you a moment ago that that test towards the end with those 20 questions was about me knowing where I am. And me knowing what I need to allow God to work on in my life so that I can move forward. It's about evaluating me. It's about a personal evaluation and being transparent and being honest about that. I must humbly assess my current state. Pride is, is, is a number one barrier to our change. And pride prevents us and keeps us from being honest about where we are and what's going on in our life. We have to admit it before we can quit it, right? You've got to admit it before you can quit it. Everything on this planet we talked about a moment ago is broken. So if you are broken, you're in good company, okay? I just want to make you feel at home. <laughs> Everything on the planet because of sin is broken. Everyone knows that you don't have it all together. Everyone sometimes but you, okay? Everyone knows I don't have it together sometimes except for me. I'm the only one sometimes walking around acting like I have it all together. Everybody knows it's broken, all right? That it's not working. Don't think, uh, it says in Romans 12, verse 3, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by faith that God has given us. He says, be humble so you don't stumble. Remember the lessons of the whales. Any of you know the lessons of the whales? Here it is, okay? You can write this down. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when the harpoon's coming. <laughs> that's the lesson of the whales. When you get to the top and you're ready to blow, that's when they harpoon you. They're waiting on you. An honest question for us this morning. What are you pretending is not a problem in your life? What are you pretending is not a problem in your life? Is it, is it in your marriage? Is it in your body? Is it in relationships? Is it in your attitudes? What is it that you're pretending is not a problem in your life? And do you have the courage to answer the tough questions? I would have rather ripped that last page out of the book and not taken that part of the test. I was fine just writing down, you know, the theology, the doctrines, all those kinds of things. I was very cool with all of that. Had it all memorized, ready to go. Had my Bible, could use that. It's fantastic. But when you get to that part, they start really getting personal. Can we skip this? Measuring yourself, it says, by the faith God has given you. The question is, what is the measure of faith that I have now? What is the measure of faith that I need in order to change? We've arrived at a good place to bring this portion of the message to a close. I want to invite our ushers to come. They're going to be passing out the elements for communion, and we want to invite you to hold on to those, and we'll receive them all together after we've prayed. That which represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. If you're new here, you're welcome to partake in communion. This is an open communion, and we do it because Jesus opened the table, and he never closed it. And since he never closed it, we never close it. So it's open to whoever would like to participate this morning. See, the wonder of the moment that we're in right now is that we can ask God to forgive us. And we can receive forgiveness. The first three principles that we've talked about today of change and tra permanent transformation of our lives is the principle of dedication, committing my body to you. And when we, in a moment, when we receive this together, that's one of the things that I want us to offer up to the Lord is our bodies. Hey, God, I haven't always been happy with my body. I haven't always been, I haven't always been the best caretaker of my body. But Lord, I, I want to I renew today and lay this living sacrifice up for good and say, hey, God, my body belongs to you. Let it be to glorify you. The second principle of, of consecration or concentration, commit my ways to you or you are going to be my model and my pattern. I've been looking at other things and patterning myself after, you know, this person, that person, but 
I'm going to make you the focal point in the center. You're going to be the pattern for how I live my life. The third one, evaluation. Lord, I'm going to come to you just as I am, and I'm going to be brutally honest with myself about where I am and what's going on. I'm not going to, not going to gloss over it anymore. The things that I'm struggling with, I'm going to name, and I'm going to take responsibility for it. I said to our kids growing up, we will, people will always do one of three things. They're going to lay blame, they're going to justify, or they're going to take responsibility. When you do something wrong in this house, you better take responsibility. You better not be laying blame. You better be trying to justify because your punishment is going to hinge on whether you were willing to take responsibility. If you were willing to take responsibility, then we recognize everybody makes mistakes. And this is a, a, a very forgiving and loving family. But until you get to that place, it's going to be hard for you. I'm going to read for you out of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the cup, he's saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread, you drink of this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so then whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And here's this word again about evaluation, examination, verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of this bread and they drink of this cup. And so that's what we're going to do right here in a moment. I want you to pray this prayer with me, will you? Lord Jesus, prepare my heart. Forgive me of all my sin. I ask you to be Lord and leader of my life. I come to you just as I am. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I choose to live my life to please only you. In Jesus' name.